And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our late afternoon session from the uh, Drizzle Guys. I am caught completely by surprise here, so uh, um, uh, Eric Day, Stuart Smith, Monty Taylor, um, and over to you guys. Thank Go you. Thank you. Uh, we've... Monty has stopped hacking especially to talk for some of this. <laughs> it's painful for Monty stopping hacking. Um, so we're going to do a bit of back and forth banter. Uh, Brian says sorry for not being able to be here, so it's three of us instead. And in no way should that Looky make there. Brian feel like uh, he's three times better than any of us. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're going to go talk a bit about uh, Drizzle Database Server and how we fix things together. So, about 18 months ago, we sat down and to rethink everything. If you had a project that had been going for years and you had the opportunity to rethink everything about it, what would you do? So that's how we started from. We decided not to decide everything was bad and we decided not to live in the past. We do not need to have a database server written today that runs on the Amiga. Nothing against the Amiga, folks. Yes, lots against the Amiga. Okay, lots against the Amiga. Please stop running database servers on Amigas. It's just not cool anymore. <laughs> yeah, if def OS2, gone. Uh, so... We live in a multi-core world, so think about many CPUs. If that HBox gone. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we, the world is 64-bit, right? Who deploys 32-bit servers? Other than Mark Atwood, who deploys 32-bit servers? <laughs> <laughs> well, the world is mostly 64-bit, right? I mean, we still have some portable devices, but yeah. you're optimized intensely for... 64-bit servers, and make sure everything still runs on 32, and the world is happy. I want to run a database server on my phone. Run SQLite on your phone? Yeah, but it's slow and only single-threaded. I may have a database server for you. Awesome. <laughs> there is a lot of RAM. If we can use RAM to increase performance and concurrency, we should do it. Mm. And the whole idea was to head towards a mod modular architecture. Is that Play-Doh? It's awesome. I love Flickr. That is actually Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> People do all my cool graphics for That's me. Fantastic. <laughs> so the idea is we head towards a modular architecture. We don't want to sit with a giant, huge blob of code that no one person can ever understand, and you need to sacrifice 15 goats before you can actually get anything into it, which is especially a problem for us vegetarians and vegans in the group. So it's we not can't really a problem for me. I eat meat. But, yeah, so we know, can't have goat. goat sacrifices as part of the idea to get how the server works. So we want to have... Lots of modules that can fit together to construct something, and also you can logically add features without bits falling off at the side that you never thought uh, would work. Yeah, and if you've ever hacked on the MySQL server, you know it's pretty much storage engines and UDFs. That's all you get, and we want to expand that to pretty much every piece of functionality available in the database server. Yeah, so we could actually rethink bits. So we also wanted to aim for the web, right? We want to say that we have lots of large-scale web, uh, web applications out there and we want a database that is designed for running the websites. And I only wish I could embed the X app in the presentation to see the awesome marquee and animated background this website has. Type world's worst website into Google, and this comes up. It's, it's awesome. That, <laughs> that website does not look any better on a big screen. <laughs> it's, uh, so why else drizzle? What would make us uh, want to refactor and rethink whole large sections of the code? Well, stuff like this. This. This makes us want to do it right here. Anybody want to explain that to me? Anyone want to take a guess what that does? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's actually C+. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you take three features from C++ and abuse them, you end up with this C++ thing. Um, so luckily there's no operator overloading here. but uh, You don't think. It depends, it depends if any of those are actually defined somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot of this in the code. Uh, we also have lovely bit, had lovely bits like this. How many have used a three-value Boolean before? I, I'd like to point out for anybody who might think that that was just somebody being clever with one, that they were actually, in fact, uh, encoding three different values, success, failure, and unknown into a bool. And there's that other place where the value 2 was expected to be held inside a bool. That's yes. one of my favorites. Of, of course, in, well, okay, not fairness, but the, the, the my bool type, which is what we transferred into a bool type, uh, was originally just a type def to int. So you'd be running around with a bool 
except it wasn't a bool, it was an int. And then they knew that, <laughs> and so they, they would stick other things in it, like cows. <laughs> yes, cows do not go into ints. Uh, that's cows do not go into bools. Don't do it at home. You only uh, so we're a cows. bit like, what the fuck, yeah. uh, for a bunch of it. So what we can do, we can clean it up, right? So we can have a clean source tree that has other people write lots of code to it. So it's really easy to go and say, I want, love your database server, I just need it to do this extra thing and actually make that happen in a reasonable time frame. So it was only Stuart that said what the fuck, because we're not allowed to say that in the United States. <laughs> so where do we come from? We fought from MySQL 6.0, uh, which was uh, more of a giant monolithic blob of code. Uh, uh, so we still have some remnants of that, so we're not all clean. It's a work in progress, uh, which is nice. Uh, so we've got, come a long way. One of the things was take things that are in the core and move them out into modules. So you should be able to not have things you don't want. If you don't want to run with authentication, don't load it. If your connection from your app to your database is a single piece of uh, network cable, uh, you just do not want to run bounce pa extra packets back and forth to do authentication for every query. You don't have to. Don't know, load one. So this graph isn't actually entirely accurate for lines of code. This is off of revision 960. So we chopped out over 700,000 lines of code before getting to this point because MySQL 6 is over a million. So yeah. it's actually quite steep if you yeah. went all the way down to Rev0. Yeah, and if you, if you can't read those numbers to the, to the left there, that's... Uh, 300,000 three, about. 300,000 lines of code is the, is the top left corner of that graph. Well, if you're looking at the size of a project, 300,000 lines of code for the core of it is, you know, possible that you could understand that within your lifetime. Yeah, it's respectable. It's right? not so obscene. It, it's not obscene. So that's kind of what we're trying to get towards. Uh, we did wacky things like trying to do more code coverage and testing and all online tools. Uh, the Hydra talk today, awesome. Uh, yes. So we're looking at the that. Hydra. Very excited about that. And we end up with a database server that is made of lots of Lego-like pieces, subtly bringing the title of the talk into the content. Uh, Crazy. So, so the idea is you can bolt on bits that you want, as well as good default implementations. So we can have uh, all the functions that you find in a database server. Things like, uh, please compute the CRC32 checksum of this blob of data. That's a module. Uh, you can have any other uh, things in there, like sum, uh, compress the length of this string. Should all be component parts. For example, if you never wanted someone doing uh, certain aggregate queries in your database server, you could just not load them in so they can't do it, uh, which is kind of neat. Uh, you could have functions to go off and call other systems, let stuff across the network, uh, send stuff into Gearman, uh, into memcached, manipulate things in memcached, uh, evaluate Lua, because that will no doubt happen at some point. You, you, can, you can send error messages to libnotify. Monty's new uh, module. Because that's really helpful on a production database server. You want to pop up little windows on your desktop saying, I wrote something to a file. <laughs> I didn't write something to a file. That's what you want. If you're running a database on the desktop, that's actually like a useful error yeah, message yeah. to have pop up. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are sensibly running production databases on their desktop server. I'm not sure how anybody has desktop servers anymore. Nah. Eh, Protocol. Eric. Yeah, yeah, Eric it, does. Well, well, also one of the, the things about this picture is this is mostly accurate as what exists today, but things like parser, we don't actually have the proper plugin type yet. That's in the future, along with things like the optimizer. Um, but that's a, you know, we're getting there, and we don't yet speak, you know, HTTP or memcached through the protocol. Um, but for the most part, all those others are actual plugin interfaces and, um, yeah, and actual plugins that exist. So... So there's a few calls for, you know, you should submit patches to have a web interface to the database. Uh, but one of the advantages is actually having a product pluggable protocol is you can do that. If you know you want to do, like, uh, specific key lookups from uh, ajax client client-side web app, you could just go directly to the database instead of fire an app that then queries the database using SQL, which I think the parse and optimize and blah, 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 start at the back. Just do a direct connection instead. Yeah, and the interesting thing about protocol is it's not completely accurately named. Um, is or I guess it is accurately named, but it's not necessarily strict to TCP IP protocols either. That can be something embedded, like you could use, you know, various IPC components, or um, one of the, the protocol plugins is actually an embedded console inside the Drizzle D server itself, which is really useful for debugging. Yeah, so you just get it as a console, like the SQLite client, which is kind of neat. Yep. It's neat. Talk about error messages. Replication. We have decided to go with a modular replication system. Mm. Mm. 
So anyone who was in love with MySQL replication, um, sorry, we ripped it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we replaced it with something that's uh, nice and We like and deleting things. <laughs> We, we replace it with something that's nice and modular, right? So we want to be able to have a replication stream that's easily parsable from about any language. And then you, what you can do from any language is do like arbitrary transformations on it or apply it to things that aren't Drizzle. So for example, if you want to get a stream of uh, a documented data structure, which is using the Google Protobufs library, so you could do this all in Python or Java or C++ or there's C bindings to it or write it's your own. Write some Haskell bindings. Of course. Yeah. So you could write it in Haskell, Haskell and take the database replication stream coming out of the server and transform that into SQL for another database server. Because it's actually data structures. You're not going to do all this horrible text parsing of SQL, which uh, a lot of people have done to try and do like upgrade the replication between things, and I guarantee you it's wrong. Uh, so instead of having these buggy implementations of kind of parsing SQL, you actually get data structures instead. So you can actually turn uh, insert, update, and delete row events into something that makes sense for this other database system, including non-SQL ones. So you could actually replicate out of Drizzle and transform the replication stream into a complete no-SQL database. Which fact, actually exists right now into Cassandra already. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and another thing about the, the replication stream is they're not only just data structures that you can easily parse, but versioned data structures. So when we change something, um, you can handle that without breaking everything backwards. And, and there's even an API library to, to help you. I mean, because it's, it's, a, it's a defined message structure, and it's a defined message structure library. And you could take those message structures, and you could you know, do all the compiling yourself. Um, but also, one of the things that MySQL is missing for years is a, a library that contained the implementation of the binary log format that they use, um, which made it really difficult if you did want to actually interact with that part of this is because it was well, it's also any database server. server as well. As far as I'm aware, the yeah. only database server that has actually got a documented standard replication log yeah, uh, so that'll be cool. that you can uh, apply to other things, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Let's grab next, because we have a whole list of plugins. Look at that. So we still perform, uh, allow pluggable storage engines. So we've improved the API a lot. The idea is that it should not be hard to say, I have a method of storing data, and I want a SQL interface on it. Uh, it should be reasonably easy to do that within, you know, a month or two to get something uh, quite usable going. It should not take forever if you've already got a storage system. Yeah, so we've made improvements along that API to make things logical to try and have like cursor objects and then uh, transaction objects and something that actually acts against the engine itself, as well as useful things like you have to say, hi, I have the following database tables and have that uh, clearly work. So there's a lot of refactoring going on there and just making it from uh, making it more and more logical and easy to code with clean code to do it that is hard to get wrong. Sort of going up the levels of uh, API cleanliness. Yeah, I think it took uh, Toru, what, maybe about a week or two to write the first version of BlitzDB? Yeah. Uh, one, one of the storage engines that we have that isn't merged into the trunk yet, um, uh, Toru from uh, Mixi in Japan, has been working on a Tokyo cabinet based engine uh, called BlitzDB. Um, and, you know, he's been, he's been hacking on it for a while because it's a side project, but the, he had the first working version of it, I, I want to say, a week or two, like after starting it. Um, and that's, I'm looking forward to that, because that's going to be cool. Yeah. So we take the philosophy of, if part of the API sucks, we go and fix the API. We don't work around it, yeah. uh, which is kind of nice. And looking at the list of storage engines, um, my ISAM will, right now, you can't actually use technically. We've hidden it. Um, right now, it's temporary tables only. And hopefully, that will be removed entirely at some point. Yeah. So our default storage engine, when you type create table, is in ODB. So it is transactional, foreign keys, crash safe, and everything. Uh, by default, all transactional. Yeah. Uh, my ASM will go. I am ripping out the final bits of code that depends on it, so you can like not load it at all. Uh, and so it's largely still there as a historical artifact. So we're getting rid of historical artifacts. Crash safety is important. From, from last night, we're having a, a chat uh, with Penny about uh, the MySQL throwing a data away, which was making her really unhappy. Apparently, she doesn't like it when people throw her data away. Um, not really sure why, but you know, uh, it's, it seems crazy to me. But all of the strictness, you can actually make MySQL extremely strict and not throw your data away in the way that she was talking about, which is the, I throw some bogus data at the thing and it just randomly sticks something else in there or silently truncates fields or things like that. Um, Where strict mode by default, there is no February 31st. Yeah, there's no February 31st. Uh, we, we've, we've done all of the strictness. There is, in fact, no way to turn strictness off yep. because strict. that's silly. <laughs> um, <laughs> What? 
Yes, I got rid of all of your modes. I, I deleted all of Mark's modes. modes. Yeah, there are no I server variables. I didn't delete all of Mark's modes. <laughs> just all of his modes. Yes. I don't the, know what that means. There are no and, server variables that changes how the SQL is interpreted. Yeah. It's interpreted the way that it's interpreted. If you look at a statement, you'll know how it will execute. Yeah. So that's a good thing for anybody so that you know, We have cares about still the something. archive engine, compressed read-only stream of rows going in. We have black hole, which is tremendous. It says, yes, I wrote it, and doesn't. Uh, so it stores nothing. It's extremely fast. As write benchmarks, it wins. Uh, brilliant, actually, one. Uh, and when you read it, you get, yep, success, no rows. And you go, wow, that was really quick. Um, so use that for benchmarking, uh, especially if you want to disbenchmark. Uh, CSB is still kind of temporary to pull stuff in and out of uh, comrade files. We have an in-memory only engine, uh, always looking for faster and better in-memory engines that will do better across threads. There is a big demand for that. If you think you can do a multi-threaded in memory table engine, guess what? You'll get lots of users quickly. Uh, we do the information schema tables through a proper engine interface. So you start to uh, get away from funny show commands and specific things there. The supported way to query metadata at the database is through tables, uh, which is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, we have inner base as well. Uh, we have all of our functions going into plugins, so you can rip these in and out, add them as you want. For some reason, if you don't want your users doing uh, Zlib compression and uncompression in your database server, you know, chewing up all your CPU time, don't load the plugin. Uh, by, on the other hand, if you need some special aggregate or data transformation thing, write the plugin. It's really easy. We did a tutorial yesterday along with explaining how to do it, everything in there, a couple of hours max. Do I? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Uh, existing plugins. Uh, Memcached show things in there, pretty easy. New this week, as in uh, written this week, uh, two new plugins. Uh, we have a powerful encryption system uh, that will satisfy all your needs, which is ROT13. Uh, uh, that's going to the tree soon. Uh, so yeah, look forward yeah. to also ROT26. Uh, yeah, uh, I was yeah, going to say uh, that. Twice as powerful uh, in the database server. And ROT, was it 760? 750, 500 something. Would somebody do the math on anyway? That, yeah. that joke is much better than the other one. ROT26 squared. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a few times it'll yeah. be excellent. We uh, think that the, the implementation of that should actually ROT things over and over again. Just, you, you know, know, test it. Uh, lib notify error messages, so you can easily, Monty decided, like, with, after seeing, uh, lib notify mm, it's like, oh my god, you can pop messages up on the desktop. It's really simple. And like, half an hour later, ah, oh, look, it's running. Fifteen minutes later, got the autoconf foo to detect compiling it properly. Uh, and so that comes up really easy. So if you have, like, your own logging infrastructure, the idea is the database does not rule the world. What you do is you plug it into your existing infrastructure and use your existing logging system, whether that be whatever you want, or whether you want authentication to go through yours. You don't have to do everything in the database. Yep. Which, speaking of authentication. Yep. PAM, HTTP. I'm, I'm not really sure. What, Stuart and I are really confused by the need for anything other than auth PAM, um, because that pretty much covers everything under Linux, and I don't know why you'd use anything else. But apparently, you, it's possible you might want to authenticate against a source that isn't local PAM. Um, and uh, if you want to do that, you can write the plugin, or you can use uh, Mark's auth HTTP uh, if the uh, characteristics of the uh, web server you're going to authenticate against uh, work the way that they need to. Yeah. Uh, and, so. and if people aren't too familiar with PAM, that gives you other things like LDAP and plenty of other yeah. authentication systems that you can use for any other services on Linux. So, yeah. so possibly one of the most asked questions when I was doing uh, professional services for MySQL was, uh, oh, when can we get LDAP authentication? And the answer was, you can't. Um, so but Write a cron job to dump it into MySQL tables every five minutes. And yeah. There is yeah. no cron jobs to dump things from yeah. LDAP into anything. It all just will work, which is kind of cool. Logging. I mean, uh, as which much is, as LDAP works at all, but you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> enjoy that. Uh, so <laughs> existing plugins, of course. We have error messages, standard error. You can log them out to Gearman, so our Eric's written lovely Gearman and other such things. Well, well actually, Mark did um, some of that work with, with Gearman logging and Gearman query analysis. So you can have a log stream or a query stream going out to Gearman workers to do real-time analysis of what's actually going on in your database at that second without really incurring that much cost at all within the database or especially on the machine that's running the database. Yeah. So. So that is you have another cluster of machines off to the side taking all the queries and, uh, that's going on your database and doing something with that data. So it's just flitting it over a TCP port to another server that then does something intelligent with it. Mm, Blitting over network. Yes, Mark, for, for, the, for the record, for the, for the video, Mark wrote that last year at LCA in his dorm room. In Hobart, not here. 
of course, since last year we were in Hobart. Yes. And not here. Uh, logging query, do full query logging, syslog. Oh my god, you can log all your database stuff just using the syslog facility. And awesome. you can do that by not piping the output of something into the logger command. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have this wacky notion of free and open source community. I uh, don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it's this new kind of thing. Uh, so the idea is all contributors are them. contributed equally. There is no secret cabal of people with commit access. Every patch is treated equally. We all have to pass the same amount of review and uh, comments and pedantic code style things, so we don't get any special exceptions and neither does anyone else. Yep. Uh, there is no, uh, there are spelling errors in the slide, but apart from that, there's no contributor license agreements. Ooh. You do not have to speak to a lawyer. Uh, all contributinos <laughs> are treated equally, apparently. Yep. So I want a contributino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so, if, so if any of you have actually pulled down the Drizzle source code right now and you've found a bug or found some comment you want to fix, if you submit that for proposal, it'll probably be merged in by the end of today or tomorrow. So yeah. it's actually that, that fast to get things into the tree and no real barrier to um, get that. Unless you write your patch in Pascal. Yes. In which, which case with, with the obvious coding guidelines. Right. But we'll help there. I mean, it's, the idea is to be friendly well, and I'm encourage not helping with Pascal code. Yeah. Uh, all project information is public. There is no secret wiki. Everything is up on the public wiki, website, mailing list, uh, ISC channel. Um, everything is public knowledge. There is no hidden plan anywhere. All the blueprints are in Launchpad to see what we're doing and what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. if there is, we don't know about it. Yes. It's yeah. certainly possible there's a secret plan. We're just not privy to it. Yeah. None of the developers <laughs> are aware of any secret plan. Uh, release early and often. We get a table out every two weeks. Uh, all the test case always run successfully on all our platforms in the main tree. Yeah. Which before is, it goes to the main tree. Before so, it so goes yeah, to the main tree. So really, if you want the newest release, just pull trunk. That could be a release at any point. We just drop an arbitrary tarball because we don't want to drop a tarball on every single code push. But the trunk is always release ready. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't ever, we don't push, we don't push to trunk until it's past all the regression tests. On uh, all and, the platforms. And all of the build tests. So, so if you download the code and Compile fail somewhere, that's a bug. So uh, it's, and it's a major bug, and it will be very weird. Yeah, that will be a new platform. So if anyone's yeah. running, unless you're running like RX5, in which case yeah. you're never going to compile. Uh, so <laughs> or anything earlier than GCC 4.1, because I don't care about you. <laughs> we I have milestone releases, so we have like a set of uh, features based on time-based things. What can we get done by this time? So following lovely milestone releases that everyone else does. Uh, so we do that every four or five three, three to four months. months. Three to four yeah. months, yep. Uh, uh, kind of on that time scale, and we're due for one really soon now. So I've looked End of January, for actually. So <laughs> yeah. probably before February 1st, we'll roll over to the new milestone and, and tag it. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're getting things done, uh, release and often. People may ask, when is Drizzle production ready? When can I use it in production? Um, some people yeah. are. We don't currently recommend it. Uh, until the next uh, the next milestone and, and, release, and, and also people who are asking that question should be asking their developers, when have you put it through your internal testing system that you trust it to be in production? Yeah. Don't ask us, you know, verify it yourselves. But yeah. it, at some point in the extreme near future, we're going to start caring about backwards compatibility, and at that point, that's when you should, you know, yeah, that's be able to trust as, us as much as you can. Yeah, that's the main thing that's actually been holding us off on saying, yeah, go ahead and, and give it a shot, is that. We, at the moment, specifically don't care if we break something from, from week to week in terms of binary compatibility or, or process. We're not giving any upgrade f script foo from version 1 to version 2 um, because it's, it's too early for that. So um, that would be a wasted effort. But the underlying stuff, since the storage engines are still the storage engines that they always were, in ODB, for instance, is just as good with your data on disk uh, so if you've ever trusted an NODB with your data, uh, there's no reason that it, there's no reason to not trust it. So it's not like it's a new product. The reason that we're saying that you shouldn't use it isn't that. We're not expecting it to eat your data tomorrow. Uh, it's just that I might make your life a living hell when I change where everything gets installed tomorrow. Uh, and and until, if you don't until mind, we say otherwise. If you don't mind dumping your entire data set, you know, which may or may not be required between versions. Use it in production right now. Yeah. yeah. If but, it tests some But, you know, when Stuart pushes a new format for the table um, definition, you definition, may have to dump and restore. And you upgrade the binary and it, there's a corrupt table definition, then, you know, dump your data and, you know, 
store. Do yeah. the appropriate things. We run our paste bin on, on, on Drizzle. I ported paste bin to Drizzle and started to use it to sign eat our own dog food, and it's run perfectly. The only problems it's ever been is when, like, I didn't write an init script to start it when I restarted the VM. That's when it was down. <laughs> uh, so I suck at system administration, but apart from that, Drizzle has worked perfectly, and it's just builds out of the tree. Uh, we get really solidly on uh, large concurrency benchmarks. We're doing uh, uh, TPC, no, not TPC, uh, DBT2. Uh, it's been ported now. We're get, making sure that runs really well. We're doing a bunch of since bench regressions. So we actually have an automated email report of this is the performance of the previous versions in the source tree, and this is your current one. And if it you know, differs by more than standard deviation, we go and find out why. Uh, so we do actually care a lot about performance, especially on many, many CPUs. So we have boxes that we're doing like make-j 128, so there's like 128 execution cores running at once, which gives you some challenges to get everything going quick. And we're getting pretty good. Yeah. yeah. No new locks. You can, like, to introduce a lock into the source tree requires black magic that we don't understand. Uh, so you can't do that. No locks. Excellent. So get involved is one of the things. Drizzle.org is our ever-improving website, uh, which is getting there. Uh, Launchpad.net slash drizzle. Uh, it's really easy to get up there. There is a uh, PPA up there that has all the packages you need for dependencies. So instead of like including lots of libraries in the source tree and always being there, if a library exists, we'll use it. If the library that exists isn't good enough, we'll make it good enough. Uh, and if we need to create a new one, we shall create that as a separate project that can be used by anyone. Fancy that. It's, it's like you could use something called, I don't know, like a package manager, or you could you know, install dependencies. Uh, Monty Somebody should like packaging. do something like I don't know a <laughs> distribution or something of you know other software. It seems like a good idea. IRC, we're all very friendly and in there at all hours of the morning. Uh, some of us, meaning Brian, occasionally sleeps for a couple of hours, but so someone's always on there. I don't really yeah. believe that. We, we have the advantage of having Stuart in Australia to cover the night shift for if you're U.S. based, and <laughs> so yeah. there's pretty much always someone on the channel there to answer a question. Yeah. There are also more Drizzle developer jobs than people at the moment. So, you know, start hacking on Drizzle, submitting patches, excellent way to get hired. Yeah. Uh, we, we literally do have more people asking, hey, where can we hire some more Drizzle developers? And, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's great. But I'm almost, even though I know good developers, I'm not going to recommend somebody for a Drizzle developer job who hasn't at least submitted a patch. You know, I mean, <laughs> the barrier to entry isn't that high there. Yeah. So, you know, come hang out with us for a day or two and, you know. We have at least over 100 people who've gotten in patches. So we have, yeah. Which so, is pretty cool. Which is, which is a fantastic thing. Cool. Uh, questions? Anything at all to do with any form of database? There's one. Yeah. What, what inspired the name Drizzle? So, uh, uh, Brian Aker and uh, Mark Atwood and I all live in Seattle. Um, and in Seattle, it doesn't really rain, it drizzles. It's, it's also in increasingly humorous with like cloud based database. Yeah. yeah. One, one of the original taglines was a database for the cloud. And, you know, yeah. Which, which is funny. Also, I've started another cloud based project called Vapor, uh, which I think is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> So any more good joke names for projects related to the cloud, we shall create projects. And yeah. Um, do you have any plans to get rid of InnoDB at all, or are you going to stick with that? Um, I don't think we've got any plans. I don't. I, so we we do not have any plans to get rid of InnoDB. Uh, if anything, I could see uh, you know there's the InnoDB fork, uh, ExtraDB that the Percona guys do um, that may be uh, you know we've been working a little bit with the Percona guys to get that ported over. Um, and then there's other other engines that do similar, uh, like that fill a similar role, like uh, like PBXT from PrimeBase, um, and sort of seeing a, a, a proliferation of plugins. Since it's a plugin architecture, seeing a proliferation of those plugins available to be able to fill that task, uh, I think is really only in anybody's interest. But uh, I mean, until so they already exist too. So you've got uh, we yeah, have we have had trees that put ExtraDB and PBXT to Drizzle. And so yeah. they're there, and at some point they'll probably get merged. There's a few extra to do along the line for that, because uh, we like uh, things to be nice and clean in there as well. But you know, they get a lot of the way past the test and everything is ported to Drizzle. Uh, we pro it would something has to be really good to be the default engine. There's nothing wrong with adding extra transactional engines in. That's really easy. The idea is we should end it up. It's essentially like the virtual file system layer, right? Just plug in extra things, and nothing bad happens. 
Uh, but to switch the default, something has to be pretty darn good. Because honestly, yeah. InnoDB is a really good uh, database yeah. engine. Yeah, and so there's really no compelling reason to to 86 it at the moment. Um, at least not that I've I've heard. I'm, people can yeah. always make arguments. And, and if you prefer a different one, it's trivial to switch the default to whatever you want it to be. Yeah. So. Anybody else? What's this? Good. Hopefully in awe, not kind of disgust. Not, not because I like punched <laughs> you in the face or something like that. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> so we're our next milestone, which is due, you know any time now, uh, uh, but in reality, like within the next few weeks, uh, we're going we're gonna to be able to, we're, a, we're aiming to say that you will be, you will have an upgrade path. So from going from one thing, to one milestone to the next, or even like along the lines, you will at least be able to do a SQL dump and restore and get your data there. Um, there were times in the past where like we broke dump, uh, <laughs> so that was problematic, but now we're going along the lines that's actually keeping up and we're testing the fact that you can dump and restore the data. So we're still, there will probably be at some point some changes on disk format, so doing in-place binary upgrade. So with MySQL, you can you know, shut down the server, uh, bring up a new version, and upgrade it in place without doing a dump and restore. Uh, we really want that back at some point, and there's a few more changes we may do uh, coming up to that and coming up to this next milestone. I probably have two or three more I have to do, but dump and restore, so you get you know, SQL dump, load it up. That's per working pretty well now and tested. Uh, it'd be really interesting to find anything where that's a problem. So. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's not the data. So close, especially if it runs well. In yeah. environment. But it's definitely, I would say it's certainly far enough along, to or close enough to where it's going to be at that point that it's certainly, you could certainly start poking at it with a stick. You know, like put it in a, put it on a dev server, put it in a test lab and start kicking it mm. uh, and seeing what falls off and then coming back and saying, hey, you broke everything. Um, <laughs> this doesn't work at all. Sweet. So if that's actually properly working now, I may actually switch my blog to it. Switch together. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> It'll be a bonnet, because honestly, I mean, running the pacement thing, I reckon it's pretty solid. And if that one crashing bug's fixed, I'll deploy my blog on it. So the the question uh, for for the for the video uh, thingy uh, is how's the query cache going and how are the plugins going there? Uh, and the answer is uh, there are none. Um, there is a query cache uh, plugin point, um, and uh, there was a guy that was working on a plugin to go to memcached yeah, uh, about six months ago, uh, and I think he got busy with something else. Haven't seen him around in a while. Um, Wasn't Toro working on one? No, too? that was. Uh, 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 Yoshinori Kano. Oh, Sano. Okay. Uh, Maybe I should get drunk tonight and write one. Yeah, but so the answer is there is none, <laughs> but that would be swell. So if there's anybody out there uh, who feels like writing a query cache plugin, um, great. Yes. Yeah, you only get the microphone on your third question. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm leveling up. No one else seems to have questions, so I might, might keep asking questions then. Um, uh, how about, um, what was I going to ask? Um, in your plugin APIs, is there anything, have you, have you made sure that none of the APIs are, are going to have an impact on threading issues? Because I know that uh, Stuart was talking the other day about the query cache in MySQL itself being yeah. single threaded and there's all sorts of issues in So it would MySQL. depend on the implementation of the plugin. So if you write a plugin that can actually uh, not, so the query cache in MySQL takes a giant lock for the whole time and it uh, doesn't scale across many CPUs. Uh, so uh, since we have the plugin points there, it's now structured in the way that it just depends on the implementation of the query cache plugin. So we're thinking uh, in the canonical idea of going into like a memcached plugin, because that's the one that always comes up, it would then work fine, because you're just splitting off to a multi-thread memcached. 
uh, or even in memory hash kind of thing, which would probably work fairly well. Uh, even a, a dumb implementation, which shouldn't be too hard. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind with any plugin writing, though, is many of the plugin points are something that can be run per session, which could mean per thread. Um, so you may have to be aware of thread context within your plugins and take the appropriate measures and don't have a global variable that just floats around and magically it's used over and over again, especially when you're writing to it. So, so there's, there's nothing really in the APIs that stop uh, high thread ability. Uh, there is still one or two tricky locks left that will go at some point that's around some of the metadata stuff uh, and opening tables, uh, and they're progressively going away. It just turned out to be a longer problem to do it. But eventually, there should be about nothing enforcing anything. And in one of the plugins we didn't mention was a scheduler plugin. And if you have some crazy use case where you know you'll only have a couple clients or one client at a time, we do have a single threaded scheduler. So only one session will be running at a time, so you could do some crazy things. But um, yeah, d expect most plugins, most practical plugins, to be able to be thread safe. Ah, Seeing that it's <coughs> modular, will it run on a phone? Will it run on a phone? N not uh, almost. You know, I gotta tell you, I haven't tried. Um, we should. It should. No reason why it would. The wouldn't. binary is a few meg. Um, well, I mean, we, we need run to it do, not terribly much. We need memory. to do a cross compile for ARM real quick, but I guess because this is this is not his phone is cool, but it's not the same thing as my laptop yet. <laughs> so, um, but for, no, I haven't tried. It's been on my list of things to do. Uh, for the last eight months. Do you have experience porting stuff to ARM? Or at least fixing, or developing stuff for an Android phone? Because we all have Android phones. It'd be cool <coughs> if we ran Drizzle on them, too. Well, we could just port it to Java, and then it would just work naturally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. I meant the other, it, the it, other thing. And for some definition of a phone, if it is an Intel x86 CPU, yes, we do run on a phone. <laughs> <laughs> Are you uh, planning to make packages available soonish? Yes. <laughs> yes, actually. Uh, yes. Um, Monty does packages. <laughs> uh, so th there's this thing as many of us have split personalities. Um, and uh, as, as a person who makes Debian packages of things, uh, I can tell you that there are currently packages of Drizzle in a PPA on Launchpad. Um, I don't expect you to install them, uh, and I have not submitted them to the actual Debian repository yet because... Um, well, I don't want you to install this and run it in production, so I'd like for you to at least make yeah. an extra choice before you do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, all of the ancillary libraries, uh, libdrizzle, uh, related things, libgearman, um, uh, memcached, or things like that, uh, are all in main Debian repositories. Um, and we, w I will start actually regularly uh, both cutting uh, packages and submitting them to Debian mainline um, once... Uh, once we've hit the point where we actually think that we will support upgrading, because I'm not going, <laughs> I'm not going to suggest a package for inclusion in Debian that does not have a potential upgrade path, because then someone will yell at me. Um, <laughs> but uh, but once that's there, then then yes, there will, those packages will uh, exist and make everyone's life happy. And I think Lens is doing some RPM stuff. Yeah, Lens. Um, yes. Lens or, has been or, using the OpenSUSE uh, oh, uh, auto builders to do. Uh, uh, to do RPMs for stuff for anybody that's doing RPM-based things, uh, and actually, as a uh, as a personal like one of the things that I work on is the plugin infrastructure. And one of the side points about where that's sitting right now is that uh, most of those plugins will individually be available as packages themselves. So if you wanted to say run PBXT, you'd have to get installed Drizzle plugin PBXT, and rather than having to pull the Drizzle source tree, drop the PBXT source into the Drizzle source tree. Compile a whole new thing uh, and then get the plugin, which isn't really much much like a plugin is like a patch to me. But you know, magical things will happen. Yeah, magical things. So anyway, so okay. yes. Okay. Then. Um, live drizzle. Is that just a C thing, or have you got bindings of particular languages sorted out yet? Uh, there are some yeah. bindings. Yeah, yeah, we have bindings. Yeah, live drizzle. Um, it's all in C. We have most of a or part of a C plus plus wrapper going for it. Um, that's not production ready yet. But the PHP extension is out there and being used fairly stable. We have a Swig wrapper, which provides Python, Lua, Ruby. Python, Lua, and Ruby at the moment. Yeah. Because we've got a uh, Patrick Galbraith, who's the same guy who, did DB, who does DBD MySQL, uh, did a DBD drizzle for Perl. Um, so that's there and available and on CPAN, uh, yep. CPAN installed DBD 
Drizzle and then, should work. And then Marcus Erickson, he manages um, the Java side of things, and he's written a JDBC driver, which has nothing to do with libdrizzle. It's all pure Java, so if you're a Java person, you can be happy about that. We, uh, we, have, Pyth uh, we have the Python through the Drizzle Interfaces project, which is the SWIG thing. Uh, one, of the guys at, one of the guys at Portland State is writing the, but that's just a, a library level implementation layer. We got a guy who is 95% done with the DB API uh, wrapper around that. Uh, and then we've got a side project there investigating uh, doing a Pyrex version of that rather than a SWIG version um, to make, uh, really just to make Robert happy. But um, it's, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> that's, that's the motivation there. But, and, um, and the other thing with the, the client libraries, um, if you're using one of the libdrizzle based plugins, which are pretty much everything but the Java one, it does also speak the MySQL protocol. So you can be using one API and then just set a bit and you start using Drizzle or MySQL or vice versa. Um, so, yes? What is libdrizzle's license? Um, it what? is BSD, so you can put it in anything you want. There is no dual licensing schemes to make money off of it or anything. Just do whatever you want with it. Let me ask that a little bit more specifically. That means I can take a BSD library and talk to a MySQL instance with it. Yes. yes, since it does speak the MySQL protocol, you can use libdrizzle as free as you wish in any type of software to talk to MySQL. And one last question before we wrap it up. Anybody? No, doesn't look like it. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, a round for our triple team. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, in an effort to sort of reduce the uh, uh, quantity of alcohol being consumed at LCA, we've decided not to give these guys any wine because uh, they've already got bottles already. <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of come to our other talks. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking three bottles between the three of us and we could have a rip for one party right now. I, I must admit that I did try to do that, but I, I got overruled. <laughs>